Okay, all right. Hello and welcome back to the Make Lemonade podcast, the show brought to you by Lemon Squeezy as we hope to inspire you to earn money from your own lemonade stand. I'm one of your co-hosts, James, and I'm back here with JR Farr, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lemon Squeezy. Today, we've got a special guest. We're joined by Justin Jackson, who's the co-founder of Transistor.fm, a podcast hosting platform that hosts almost 30,000 podcasts. Justin has bootstrapped the business since 2018 and has used it to build a better life for himself and his small group of employees. In this episode we discuss if video is going to be essential for podcasts in 2024 is youtube going to kill off the audio podcast we also touch on how justin is taking the slow and steady approach to building transistor but let's kick off talking about why justin invested in a new video setup this year okay all right we just touched upon the setup that you've done you've made it looks absolutely beautiful do you think more people should be investing we've all got lovely setups now look at this anyone that is watching this on video will go wow all three of those lovely setups but it wasn't this way six months ago so do you do you think it's essential like why did you make the investment in your space well it's not essential it depends on what you're doing for me i i you know i've always made a lot of video even while i was focused on audio podcasting i was still making tutorial videos and screencasts and like it or not I've become kind of the face of Transistor and so I wanted to take that role more seriously and that meant yeah upgrading the the video stuff but I think there's folks that you know if most of what you like doing is writing and that's most of what you're doing every day and you're mm. rarely on video interviews or making videos or whatever I don't think it's that necessary. I think there's like intangibles to it too. I think for me, it's like, I don't know, I get all excited actually for the, for the podcast. Cause I'm, you know, I have the setup. I know what it looks like. I'm, I got everything yeah. dialed. You know what I mean? You get a little bit of excitement to kind of get the recording yeah. going. So no, that's definitely there. Uh, there's some people though. The opposite is true. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, Oh man, I got to go on video. Please. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's uh, not for everyone, but I, yeah. I do think, and you know, Transistor is an audio podcasting platform, but I do think video is going to be more and more important. I was just going to ask as, as a follow-up to this, because yes, you run Transistor, you're heavy in podcasts. It seems like a lot of people are consuming podcasts in YouTube. I do, mm -hmm. personally. That's how I like to watch a podcast. Do you? I do. Yeah. It's like my preferred way. In fact, like anytime you send me something, I actually just go look to see if there's a YouTube clip of it. But Interesting. can you set that up for me a little bit? I, I'm just curious. Sorry to derail, but yeah. are you, are you just watching clips? Are you watching them at your desk at work? Are you going home and watching them on your television? Like what's the, uh, what's the context there? You know, what's funny is it's, so it's not so much the clips it's more. So yeah. So like I use the arc browser and when I'm, when I roll up a YouTube video, like I can put the little, like literally the video off to the side while I'm working. Yeah. And I'll actually kind of watch it and listen to it. And then a lot of times just like at the gym or something, I'll just on the treadmill or something, I'll just literally have the video on and watching it. And so mm -hmm. I know a lot of people like the audio, but I think this is going to sound really bad. Maybe this is why it works for me, but my mind will start to race. If I'm listening to something, I'll hear yeah. something and then it'll take me off into a tangent. And then within five minutes, I'll forget where we're actually at in the podcast. If I'm mm. watching it, I feel like my attention is more focused on it. But Ooh, that's curious. Which is weird, I guess. But I guess no, what I'm trying to say, Justin, is like, do you see people doing that? And like, did, are more people attaching the video version of their podcast? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the especially for new shows, the common way to produce a show is to record it in something like Riverside, like we're doing right now. So they're recording the video and the audio. And then they'll either edit the video and upload that to YouTube and then export the audio version and upload that to Transistor. Or they'll just edit the audio, that becomes the long form, and then they're just grabbing video clips mm. for promotion. Okay. And okay. I think that's, again, if you like being on video, if your show lends itself to video, you should do that. In terms of promotion, it's definitely better to promote the talking heads version of that yeah. clip 
as opposed to like one of those animated audiograms. We've done a lot of tests on this and consistently the actual talking head video does better. But yeah, it's it's a trend and it does keep me up at night a little bit, you know, having YouTube be so big. Yeah. Um, and I I think what gives me peace is podcasting has been around a long time. And if you look at its growth, it grows 10 to 15% every year, consistently, regardless of what's happening on TikTok or YouTube or whatever. 10 to 15% growth in listenership per year. And there's about, I don't know, 5 million podcasts in the world right now, audio podcasts. And that's grown quite a bit as well. But that's still, you know, there's way more YouTube channels than 5 million. There's probably, I don't know, 100 million. Uh, there's way more blogs. There's way more Twitter accounts. There's way so podcasting has this nice, it's a big enough market that we were able to build a nice business, but it's never going to be a crazy growth, like off the rails uh, behemoth like YouTube or like, like WordPress or anything like that. It's just 10 to 15% a year. And for us, that's been a great place for us to build a business. And we're seeing now, like for kids, you know, I, I have four kids aged... 14 to 21. And when they talk about podcasts, a lot of times it's they're watching it on YouTube or they're watching clips. But what we've seen is a lot of young people start a podcast, quote unquote, on YouTube. And then eventually they're like, oh, I want to publish this on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and everything. So now we're getting a lot of folks who started on YouTube and then want to publish the audio version. It's the same thing when Anchor came out, that's Spotify's yeah. free podcast hosting platform, I was scared. I was mm -hmm. like really worried about it because Transistor is credit card up front. You get a 14-day free trial, but then it's like minimum $19 a month. And I talked to my friend Nathan Berry, who runs ConvertKit. I was like, I'm so worried about this. Like, like Spotify is going to destroy us, you know? <laughs> and he said, you know, I was worried about the same thing when Substack came around. Because Substack, you can start a free uh, email newsletter. And ConvertKit is email newsletters. That's Nathan's company. And he said, Substack is giving us so much business. Because people start for free on Substack. And then they, there's either something they don't like about it. They want to level up. They want to become pro. Or they're not getting the customer service that they need from a free app. Sometimes when people go on Transistor's live chat and they're like, what's the biggest difference between you mm -hmm. and Anchor? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm the CEO of Transistor. I'm pretty sure Daniel Ack at Spotify is not answering your <laughs> customer support messages. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's ways you can compete. But to answer your question, video is a threat. If you're doing your old SWOT analysis from business school, you know, <laughs> it, video is a threat in the threat category. But I also think it has the potential to grow our business because yeah. more people are going to know what a podcast is. More people are going to be interested in the theater of making a podcast. You get a nice microphone and you get the camera and then you're making the videos. But then it's like, oh, what about all the people who are commuting or jogging or walking and they want the audio version? J Justin, do you think that because Transistor is a quote unquote a hosting company, you're hosting audio, would mm -hmm. you ever host the video? I mean, or is it more just the distribution of YouTube that's more meaningful? And, and then is the video hosting like too commoditized or something that you guys wouldn't want to add as a feature? Well, we, if my team's listening to this, they're <laughs> laughing because I bring up video all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy in Slack that's like, I know we don't want to think about this, but we should think or ponder video. And, you know, the engineers on the team, especially my co-founder, John, He's like, video is tough. It requires a lot of bandwidth, and bandwidth is the expensive part. The hosting is pretty cheap, but it's bandwidth. It's sending those files to millions of people that cost you a lot of money. And it's just, it requires a much more robust infrastructure. So we do think about it all the time. Uh, video has been a part of podcasting from the beginning. You could, yeah. the RSS spec allowed you to have an audio enclosure or a video enclosure. 
and Apple Podcasts, uh, iTunes, when it launched, had, uh, there used to be a little button you could click audio mm. podcast or video podcast, and it would allow you to filter all the video podcasts. That's how I got into podcasting is often I'd be like on the bus going to my job downtown watching Dignation on my iPod video <laughs> classic, oh, yeah. you know? So it's been around a long time. The thing now is that YouTube just owns video. And yeah. so it, you're, you're fighting a pretty strong current if we could offer video hosting and people could have a separate feed, for example, that allows them to publish video on Apple Podcasts. Spotify hasn't opened up the video. Like, we can't distribute video to them right now. And so maybe if Spotify opened it up and maybe if Apple kind of improved their video side, we would consider it. But right now, when people think video, they think YouTube. And honestly, maybe... It's one of those things, like maybe it's just better to let YouTube do all that stuff. So sure, it's a threat. It's a threat. Like culturally, everybody could just move to consuming podcasts on video, and that's a threat. But the, there's also an opportunity there, which is it could just help create a bunch more people that want to are interested in hosting audio podcasts. So I think our, our tactic right now is to wait and see and you know, if we needed to, I, I'm sure we could, but right now it's not, there's not a lot of people, when we get a lot of requests for video hosting, and then when I ask folks what they mean by that, ultimately it ends up like they'd be better off just publishing on YouTube. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you've made steps to integrate with YouTube in certain ways, the best way you can, so you can now put a link to your uh, embeddable link quite easily yep. into your transistor website. I do this with all my podcasts. It's interesting to see how JR consumes pods that it's for new shows, it's YouTube. I find myself doing the same if it's a new show. I rarely mm -hmm. can watch the whole thing, but I am watching them more. But anytime there's a new show, I'm like, ah, oh, my podcast app is a real pain to try and find it. Search functionality's not there. I use Pocket Cast, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah. And so I just go onto YouTube, search up either the person's name that I'm interested in or the podcast. I'll watch it there. And then if I like it, it goes into my mm -hmm. podcast app yeah. with yeah. my regular listening. Yeah. yeah. And can we, can we talk about that a bit? Because I think the tech industry is obsessed with reducing friction. And in some ways, it's good, right? A user experience, a good user experience often means reducing friction. But there's also an argument for having some friction. So, for example, an audio podcast, in its typical, the typical way it's consumed, somebody's driving home from work, and if I say something or you say something that makes them mad, they have to wait 20 minutes driving <laughs> home just stewing on it. They have to park their car, they have to kiss their wife, they have to, you know, pat their kids on the head, and then they can go to their room with their iPhone and go, okay, now I'm going to tell these guys what I think. And that means sending you an email or maybe sending you a tweet. I'd argue that in that case, actually having some friction is a good thing. It's good for people to have to slow down. For people to not be able to just knee-jerk reaction every, you know, oh, you said something I don't like in this TikTok video. So I'm like, if you've read the comments on TikTok videos, it's not the pinnacle of human <laughs> achievement, right? It's like, it, they're awful. And YouTube, YouTube comments are terrible too. It's because there's no waiting period. There's no like, yeah. hey, just slow down. It's one of the reasons I think John and I were attracted to podcasting is that it's slow media it's slow mm. technology it's like not obsessed with like grabbing your eyeballs and like addicting you and then you know sending you another recommendation and keeping you on the platform scrolling all day it's slow it's like you choose a podcast and then you're driving for a half an hour or you're walking the dog for a half an hour or you're doing the dishes for half an hour and there's a lot of friction in the process now would I like there to be better ways of discovering podcasts and finding podcasts? Yes, but also maybe, like maybe it's okay that it's, it's hard work. <laughs> like maybe it's okay that you see a clip of a podcast you're interested in and it takes like three impressions mm. before you're like, you know what, I'm just going to open up my podcast app and search for that show and yeah. then add it. it maybe that's okay. Yeah. 
maybe it's okay to have people work hard because anyone who does go through the process of following your show or responding to your show, that means something. If you have a if you have 500 regular listeners to a podcast, those 500 listeners are way more committed and I would argue more meaningful than 500 views on a YouTube video or 500 views on a TikTok, right? It means something. And I, there's a show I love called No Plans to Merge. It's two programmers talking. And, uh, you know, they were talking about all the stuff that's going on with Twitter. And they're like, we might, like, maybe Twitter just goes away. What would happen to all of our followers on there? Like, we'd be, we would have no way of reaching our people. And they're like, well, actually, we'd have this RSS feed. And this RSS feed has, these are the real ones. You know, these are the ones that really care, that have been following us forever. And we could still reach them even if Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube crumbled to the ground. Mm -hmm. RSS is pretty resilient. And the people that are there, there's some meaning there. I agree wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, well, the very reason why I love podcasting so much across the shows that I do, the shows that I do for clients, you know, it runs deeper than other mediums they can do. And sometimes it's slower to get going. It's harder. It feels more analog in a way um, because it's just talking. It's a radio show, essentially, for those mm -hmm. niches. But in, in terms of podcasting uh, now, Justin, d uh, are we past peak podcasts in terms of people starting them? Because we went through that massive boost in during COVID where everyone was starting a podcast. Mm -hmm. Now it seems the barrier to entry is lower. You can start a podcast really easily with tools like Riverside, yeah. using your phone even. Yeah. So what are the opportunities within podcasting now to either start a show or stop uh -huh. around podcasting? Yeah, this is another example of maybe making it easier is not better. <laughs> so for, so podcasting, for example, when, when John and I started Transistor in 2018, I think there was around 500,000 podcasts. Now, we went from 500,000 to 5 million. And most of those shows are on Spotify's free hosting platform, Anchor. Most of those shows don't make it past three episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Most of those shows, you know, pod fade very quickly. Most of those shows, they were not serious about it. And part of the reason was Anchor made it easier. But the people that last are the folks that take, take it seriously. There's more work. It's like, no, I'm going to get a good microphone. I'm going to be think through this. I'm going to record 50 episodes for a year before I even think about evaluating my progress, right? As opposed to folks that are used to posting a TikTok video and getting a thousand views yeah. and that dopamine hit and it's like, wow, this is great. And it's like you, you post your first podcast and you get five listens and you're like, ah, that, that's no good, right? Now, again, on the other side of this, do I want to make it easier to start a podcast? Yes. Do I wish more people would start a podcast? Yes. But there's uh, some nuance there, right? And... So are we past peak podcasting? I mean, there's another, there's another element in there, too, that maybe I shouldn't talk about it, but I will. The, the, this whole peak <laughs> podcast thing was, like, largely driven. So right now, all the news stories are about layoffs in podcasting, yeah. shows being canceled, you know, people pulling back funding, you know, Spotify reorienting its strategy. A lot of this had to do with something that's called overcapitalization, which is when usually a big company comes into a space and just floods it with dollars. We saw this in the broader economy when interest rates were low and there was just tons of money sloshing around. Overcapitalization, that led to the crypto bubble and people buying JPEGs for millions of dollars. <laughs> that's that's overcapitalization. And the same thing can happen in any sort of market and category. So before Spotify came in and invested, I think they invested over a billion dollars in podcasting. Podcasting as a whole had never made more than a billion dollars worth of revenue mm. in the year. The whole industry. And you're investing a billion dollars in this thing that it, we've never made more than a billion dollars total. <laughs> so you're sloshing all this money around and it leads to these knock-on effects, Right. All of a sudden, you're hiring tons of people to make shows, producers and editors and everything. Those people become more rare because 
you know, so the salaries go up. That leads to more people joining the podcast industry to get those salaries. Then Sony's got to copy you. They got to start an age, uh, podcast production division and Apple's got to up there. So it just, everyone's upping the game, but the underlying economics don't actually support it. And so peak podcasting is like, okay, well, what does that mean? Does that, are we seeing, are we seeing companies pull back because the underlying economics turned out to not be there? Yeah. Was there a lot of money spent that was just, it was unsustainable? Like you can't have, I don't know, whatever, 3000 podcast agencies all producing shows about murder. (laughs) Like (laughs) there's a limit. We could only have so many murder shows, right? And so, sure, if that's peak podcasting, we're past that. Transistor has grown every single month since we started in 2018. Hell yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's not to say we're going to grow forever, but we are still seeing people who are serious about starting podcasts, who want to do it well, who want good customer support, they want some assistance, and they're still excited about making shows. And I think... I think that's going to continue in the same way that the listenership has increased 10, 15% every year. I think we'll see 10, 15% of creators who are serious about making a show joining podcasting every year. And I think it's got a bright future in that sense. Mm -hmm. I like this conversation because it's actually teeing up something that I wanted to ask Justin. So when I read your 2023 year in review, I read a lot of your newsletters. Like Like my favorite one that you've probably ever done was around surfing. Business the, is surfing. Yep, because I have a same, I have a similar, like analogy. Mm-hmm. But I think that when I read it, I read it from like a founder's perspective, where you you almost sounded like we've hit these goals. I'm not really sure what our new north star is. Is that okay, or is it not? Right. So 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 let's have that context. And then let's go into 2024 of podcasting. Are we at peak? All these things we're talking about and the way that the world is coming. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm going to tee up this question, but you have, so, it sounds so you like have I'm, all, I'm about to be in trouble here. I'm, no, I'm no, ready. no, no, I just, I just want to make sure that, <laughs> yeah, cause I'm so, I'm so interested. So, uh, okay. When I come from the web hosting world and back in the day, I saw the rise of WordPress which was blogging and then web hosting at the time was really, really popular. And then Squarespace and then Webflow and then all these different, you know, solutions came out for 10 years that started to eat away at potentially this WordPress ecosystem. You could still argue that it's, it's a lot, but I would, I would argue from my, my seat, a lot of that was driven by the hosting companies, just auto installing WordPress. Is that actually mean everyone's using it? I don't know. So with that being said, when you think about the 14-year-old, the 15-year-old, and the way that they're being conditioned and used, or like from their phones, right, with consuming content and the YouTube way and TikTok, if I was Transistor, I would be like where you're at. I would be thinking of video. How do I lean into this? How do I think the people five years ago that were getting you know exposed to podcasts, now the 18-year-old's 20, 23 years old, they want to start a podcast at the company they're at because they're the young gun marketing guy that just started at the Series A company that wants to start the podcast. I'm just saying if I was Transistor, I would maybe want to lean into this. And with where you're at right now, where you're not sure what the new North Star is for Transistor, maybe it's a good time where you guys build something where it's like, hey, we're going to go after this next thing that feels like we can go after. So you know, transistor guy, podcast guy, what do you, what do you think? Okay. Let's take this in stages. The first thing you said is like, you know, kids maybe are consuming more video Yeah, and maybe, you know, all of the Gen Zers, they're going to grow up and they're going to be like podcasts. Like yeah. that's something, you know, every time I, I do a weekly call with my daughter, she's, she's helping me with some executive assistant stuff. And she'll always be like, Oh, I watched a podcast the other day. I'm like, huh? (laughs) She's like, oh, sorry. I listened. I listened. But here's the thing. So I'm born in 1980. And when people were looking at youth culture in the 90s, they were like, oh, look at these youths. Like, what's going to happen when they get into the real world? They're going to be whatever. It was like short attention spans. They're going to be on MTV. And then the millennials came out. It's like, oh, these millennials are all about text messaging email is going to go away 
because millennials are just text messaging. And the truth is, and this might not go on forever, but one of the patterns we've seen is that people grow up, they go to college, they get a job, and then all of a sudden, the folks that we never thought would be using email are using a lot of email, <laughs> right? They have to learn to write good emails. They have to learn. Mm. They, their email is still very much alive. And this is another pattern that we've seen with podcasts. So people start off, you know, maybe they're just watching them, but eventually they have a commute. Eventually they're tired of watching so much video. They're tired of, we see this all the time, actually, folks that are like, I need an alternative of TikTok. I need something that's just more mindful, more simple, more restful. And podcasting still has a job to be done there, right? Even if you spent your entire teenage years and college years just watching TikToks, eventually people grow up. Eventually they become adults. And so I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. But having seen enough of these, I'm... I still think there's enough space in audio only podcasting. Again, this is not, I don't think Transistor is going to be, I don't think Transistor will ever have a hundred million dollars in annual revenue. So I, I'm almost certain of it. I could be wrong, but the market is just not that big. When we were swimming out to catch this wave, I had a pretty good idea of the size and shape and momentum of the wave. And I, my sense is it'll probably continue like this for a long time. In the same way that people are still writing blogs, people are still reading blogs, people still use RSS feed readers, too. Yeah, yeah. People are still receiving email newsletters. Um, these things all still exist, and maybe we're not in peak blog anymore, maybe we're not, whatever. There's still enough space to build a nice, long-term business on those, um, on things like web hosting and WordPress, like WP Engine is a great business. I would love to have that business. Um, yeah. And I, I think they've still got lots and lots of growth. Um, in our world, we might think, well, nobody uses WordPress anymore. But the WP Engine folks know, like, actually, there's a lot of businesses <laughs> that use WordPress. Yeah, 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 Jason said that. So, so I, okay, so that's a good answer. So you're kind of yeah, you're like, hey, we're here when you want to come over to this, you know, do this, this is what we're for. So what have you thought about more what your North Star is going to be? Or are you okay with where you're at now where you've, are you a little bit of a, like this floating in the abyss kind of thing? Yeah. I think part of that is just our stage now, which is, you know, I spent my whole life in pursuit of building a business that works. So I started, I, you know, I was, I had like, I was putting on raves in high school and then I was doing web design, and then I was filming wedding videos, and then I opened a snowboard shop, and then I, you know, I, I, I've just had this continual pursuit of building a business that works. And, you know, each of those businesses had elements that worked or whatever. And then the idea for Transistor came along, and at the beginning, you're just so driven the North Star, especially if you're bootstrapping, is I can't wait until we can go full-time on this. And then once you go full-time, you're like, I can't wait till this gives us really nice margins. Not, yeah. just, like, not just profit margin, but like I can't wait to pay myself more. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to get some dividends. I can't wait to have more time. I can't wait, you know, all of those elements. And we built that. And then in the last two, three years, I think John and I in our reflections have been like, okay, that, this is definitely a less potent time in terms of like that drive, like yeah. that ambition. And I'm 43 now. And part of me is wondering, well, maybe this is okay. <laughs> maybe this is okay. And there's other things I'm excited about that, like I'm still excited every day to wake up and serve Transistor customers. I'm excited about marketing problems. I'm excited about working with uh, my teammates. You know, we've got this small little team of, of what are we at, five, six people now? I, it's just fun. It is fun, but it's different. It's not that same drive we had in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think part of me is just asking the question out loud, 
is this okay? And maybe yeah. it is okay. I yeah. I feel fulfilled in many ways. And one idea is to take that margin that we have now and or that I have now and apply it to other areas of my life. How can I invest in my family? How can I invest in my community? How can I, you know, there's there's all of these other opportunities that fire me up. And I also have more time to do thinking and writing and, you know, developing some other things that fire me up as well. So, but it it, it could be, you know, like my friend Nathan at ConvertKit, he wants to build ConvertKit to $100 million a year in revenue. And um, I don't know, maybe one day that would fire me up. But I don't want to force anything. Sometimes it's just nice, like, getting to where you want to go and then enjoying it. At least for a little I, bit. Yeah, like you're right. And I, as you're talking, I'm sitting there thinking the same thing. Like, yeah, I mean, it's really smart. Like, it, it, it's actually refreshing because I think we live in a world where it is always the next thing and where do I go and what do I got to do and how do I make it better and how do I make it bigger? And I think the other thing too that you may, I don't know if you've experienced this, but we talked about this with Rob Walling, where you have a bit of, if you do it too much, when you don't have that, you lose a little bit of your identity. You have this identity crisis. And I think by you getting to this point where you're now able to work on different things, invest in different things, build other things, Justin's not just transistor. Justin is transistor plus these other things. And that's really healthy. Like, you know what I mean? As an entrepreneur, we get a little bit wrapped up in this identity. So I think, I think it's really smart. And it's like uh, some of the best relationship advice I got was the psychologist saying, listen, like you, you get together with somebody for love, but at some point you have, to, you have to sit down and say, okay, what is this relationship for? What is its purpose? What is this serving in our lives? Because if it's not for something bigger than you know, us individually, why, why go through all this difficulty? It's like yeah. super tough. And business is the same way. What is this business for? What is... What role is it serving in your life? And for me, one of the people I always wanted to be more like was Derek Sivers. Mm. You know, Derek was like, he built a very successful company in CD Baby. He sold it. And now he spends his time following his curiosity, writing amazing essays and books, going dark for like six months at a time where you don't hear anything from him, where he's just going down a rabbit hole. And... I often think like, you know, if I had $20 million in my bank account tomorrow, what would I be doing? And it's like, well, I would want to be doing some writing. I'd want to be doing some podcasting. I'd want to be making cool stuff with cool people. I'd want to be investing in my family. I'd want to be investing in myself. And it's like, well, I get the opportunity to do that right now. (laughs) And so why add... And, and that's not to say, like, maybe I do, maybe I will need another big life goal in the next years. I don't know. I don't know. But the, there is something nice about saying, there's something nice about that life. And it, there's this temptation for people to do stuff that they see other people doing that they assume is giving them something, some sort of fulfillment, like... I'm going to grow a company to a thousand people. Well, why? Mm -hmm. What goal is that going to serve in your life? And I think it helped that John and I started Transistor. We were both in our late 30s, and we'd just been through the ringer with other startups, and we could see other founders and what their lives looked like. We could see other teams and what was the long-term effect of, you know, different ideas and ideologies on the team. And when we got together, it was like, okay, this company has to have an economic engine that works, that's going to provide us with a good life. That's why we're building this. And so we're going to put some guardrails up, some purposeful guardrails that are where we're going to ask the question, like, is it, is it worth making this bet on this feature or this thing or whatever? Because sure, it might bring us, it has the potential maybe, maybe to, maybe we'd grow 10 times if we introduced video hosting. 
But maybe also it would just make our lives way worse. We would be way more stressed out. We wouldn't like working for transistors much. And maybe it also brings us only like 1.5 times revenue. Yeah. 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 And so these are all we, we, to, to think in bets, like here's a bet we're making, but what's the payoff that you're looking for? And if the payoff is just like, well, I want 150 times revenue. Okay, well, why do you want to do that? And then you ask, we, you ask why five times, and then eventually it's like, well, what I really want to do is be able to go snowboarding more often. Okay, well, <laughs> let's, let's back up then. Maybe, maybe we, you we just think, need to simplify. We think the same way. We Like literally this morning with my founders of Lemon Squeezy, that's how we talk is the bets we're making in 2024. I always say just to kind of wrap up this whole like section that yeah. we're in, Justin, in your 2023 review, the thing that stuck out to me the most was you had two sentences and you talked about these two dimensions, which was the product exists to make our customers' lives better. The company exists to make our team's lives better. And I think that resonated with me the most and kind of capsulates everything you're saying. And I think that's a good takeaway for everyone to kind of like just take a second to think of it like that. You know? Yeah, and, and dream along those, along those lines. Like, wouldn't right. it be great if we had a product where, in our case, our customer is a creator and then they have an audience? Wouldn't it be great if we had a product that made everybody's lives better? And that's everything. That's customer service. That's caring about people when they show up with problems. That's improving the UI and the user experience. That's introducing features that make people's lives better. All of that stuff. But then the company, who's the company for? Like, why did we start this thing? Yeah. You know, the, the, products, the products for the customer. We want to make their lives better. And that's, you know, most people in startups would agree with that. Like, yeah, we're, we're trying to make a dent in the universe. We're trying to produce something that, that makes people's lives better. Okay. But the company, who's that for? Well, that's for us. That's for the team. The company should be making our lives better. What good is it to make a customer's lives better, but your whole team is miserable. What good is it in providing the best customer service in the world, but the people providing the customer service are underpaid, stressed out, miserable? Such a simple thought, but it's, it's, it really gets you going when you, yeah. when you start to dive into it. And, and dreaming along these lines is like, once Transistor was really providing for us and we decided to slowly start hiring people, it became clear, like, wow, like this company has really changed our lives. Like the house I'm in right now is because of Transistor. The lifestyle I enjoy is because of Transistor. The things I've been able to offer my kids and my family and my community, it's Transistor. Yeah. Why would we not also try to extend that to every team member? Why, why not help them pay off student loans? Why not help them achieve their educational goals? Why not help them make progress in their lives that's meaningful? Why not give them in an amazing work-life balance? Because I like it, you know? I love taking time off at Christmas. I love my whole tech career. I never got a Christmas bonus. And I always felt like, man, I'm working my butt off and I had, you know, four young kids and Christmas is expensive. And I always felt like, man, even if they could give me like 500 bucks, just, just the act would mean so much. And now John and I are the boss and we're like, we want to do that for our team. Yeah. And it's fun. It's fun. And I think people sometimes get fired up about stuff that they think is going to fulfill them like growth and whatever, accolades, getting in the media, being famous, where the thing that actually fulfills you is making your family's life better and then making your team's life better and making your community better. Yep. Those, that's it, right? And if you're doing that, that's a good life, man. Justin, how many podcasts do you have on Transistor? I think it's like almost 27,000. So we don't have 27,000 customers because you can start unlimited podcasts on one account. Have you thought about selling the company? Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Is there a number? Is it a number that you have or is it just, is it, is uh, it, not, is it more of a... Okay, so let me talk this through. I, I have a different answer than my business partner. For me, I have a very good life, but the anxiety I have is I still haven't made and put away enough money that there's like no worries. Mm -hmm. So 
the anxiety for any, especially bootstrapper, is you've built this thing that has some value, right? Transistor is profitable. It's got good revenue. It's got a lot of customers. It has value, but it's unrealized. And so, you know, I think about like, well, if I died, uh, a lot of that value would just be lost. And so I, I think if there was the right number, sure. And maybe, I don't know what that would be, but it would be, it would have to be considerable. Have you had any interest? Have you had any inbound? What's interesting is we had so much interest in the first three years Like when we were sharing our story and we were sharing our our revenue metrics. And I think people also just loved John and I's philosophy. Like there was something about it that resonated with them. We had a lot of inbound interest. And then maybe it's some of my rhetoric now where I'm like, I'm interested, but I'm not interested in the way that people, you know, most acquirers, (laughs) like I I don't want to work. I don't want to work for a worse company. I don't want to get acquired by a company that makes my life worse. Right. So deal Uh, structure is also important, not just the money. Deal structure. And and it's even a higher bar for uh, my business partner, John. Like he's just like, you know, there's a, there's a funny story that I, I tell, which is like early on, I don't know what they would be. Fortune 50, like massive corporation we've all heard of. They had about 20 podcasts on Transistor, I think at the time. Mm-hmm. And someone from head office got a meeting with me and they're like, we want to bring in, we got on the call. He's like, he's like, man, I've been talking to all of our, all the people internally who use Transistor. They love you. I've been doing research. You're like consistently in the top three recommended podcast hosting platforms. We want to do a deal where we bring all of our organization's podcasts to you under one roof, one contract. It would have been like, 500 accounts or something like that. Mm. Like we're talking a lot of accounts and I'm talking, I'm like, well, that sounds fine to me. Like (laughs) it would just go on the website and sign up with your credit card. But he's like, so after this call, let's get my legal team in touch with your legal team, my accounts, people in touch with your accounts, people. And at the time it was like, just John and I, we were the only two people. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold up. Stop, 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 stop. I said, we don't have all those people like, (laughs) and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, transistors, just two people. It's just me and my buddy, John. And he was like, what? (laughs) You're running a whole company with two people. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's just us. And he said, well, I'm offering you a lot of money. Like if we bring all of, if we sign this deal, this enterprise contract, Mm. Sure, it's going to be some pain to go through it. And sure, you're going to have to offer us some additional things. And, and I said, well, if, if we have to sign all that contract, I don't, I'm not interested because we'd have to hire like 10 people just to, and it sounds like hell. Like, I, don't, I just don't want to do that. And he said, well, if, if you do that, you're going to lose out on this deal. I said, that's okay. I, I'd rather just yeah. have a better life. I said, like, <laughs> literally, after this call, I'm going snowboarding. And he's like, he just couldn't believe it that I was yeah. like not willing to bend over backwards and like do it. Cause he was used to people going, what? Five accounts. Okay. I'll do everything. You know, yeah. I was like, no, I, I want a good life. And he kind of sat back for like, I don't know, a good minute. And he kind of leans into his microphone and goes, what if we bought you? And I said, there's just no way we would come and work for you. Cause I know what it would be like. It would be worse. Yeah. It, we wouldn't have a good life. We'd have to give up everything we've built. I wasn't rude about it, but at yeah. the end of the call, he was just like, respect, man. Like, I, I think it's great. And so we didn't get that contract and we've been fine. <laughs> and we didn't get acquired by them and guaranteed our lives are better because we weren't acquired. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, J- Justin, I think we're, we're going to wrap up on time here. We we've had more stuff we want to talk about, but specifically because I, 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 I saw your your year in review in almost two parts. You got part one, which was transistor. Yeah, we're sort of building this company and life for ourselves. Then the second half, I loved because I felt like you were just more passionate about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I yeah that I was trying. That's what I was trying to allude to earlier when, when yeah. I brought that up. Yeah, family business is awesome. I love I love 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 that you've 
Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask about the you investing in indie indie businesses and how you're yeah. thinking about doing that. We'll have to do a part two. I I think that's a good way to actually end it because I am very passionate about Transistor because of what it's enabling. Mm. It's enabling me to work, do great work at work. It's enabling me to work with great people, serve amazing customers. And then the other part of our lives, which aren't work, it's enabled all this other stuff that, frankly, should be more exciting. Family, friendships, community, living life, making memories, going on adventures. That's real life. And this little piece that people focus on in entrepreneurship is like actually it's significant, but only in the sense that it becomes the engine for your actual life. So right. I'm happy to come back anytime and talk about the good life. Let's do it. Let's actually do a part two with Justin. I'd, I'd be so up for that. It. Justin, you're an incredible guest as always. Thank you for coming on this episode of Make Lemonade. Oh, this was super fun. I love the show too. I've been, it's been my go-to whenever you publish a new episode. I've been really digging it. So yeah, thanks for having me on. Okay, all right.